Hi there, I'm Robert Tursik, and this week in social media, we're talking about brands in action in social media. And our guest is Simon Mainwaring, the author of the New York Times bestseller, We First. Check it out here on This Week in Social Media. This week in social media, we're talking about brands in action, and we've got Simon Mainwaring. He's written this terrific book, We First. I had the pleasure of getting an early copy of it to do uh, some commentary and early review on. I really enjoyed reading it. It's excellent. It's a superbly written book. Simon is also the CEO and founder of a company by the same name, We First. Now, the book has been doing fantastically well. Tell us, it's on Amazon. It's in the one of the bestsellers on Amazon, New it's York Times. It's been a New York Times best. Thank you, Robert. It's been a New York Times bestseller. It's on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, and also Amazon named it one of their top 10 business books of 2011 so far. Super. Well, we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that. First, Simon is a, is a longtime marketing expert. So Simon has been working in the field of branding and marketing and, uh, for many, many years. He was a copywriter at Whedon & Kennedy, which is that super cool agency that uh, handles Nike, among many other great brands. So he's had that experience uh, kind of from inside the corporate machine of branding. But he's made this shift in the last few years towards uh, social media for the social good. Tell us a little bit about your recent experience uh, working with charitable organizations and so on, and how did that shift your understanding of branding and marketing? Absolutely. By working with nonprofits who are doing such meaningful work, I realize that they can A, be more effective storytellers, and B, these social media tools can help them scale their efforts much more effectively. And I also recognize that brands need to do more with their cause marketing so that they can do something that's meaningful to their customers. So both brands and nonprofits could benefit through social media. So this is kind of the big idea of We First, the company, and We First, the book, right? At the heart of it, you've got this radical idea of reinventing capitalism, not a small undertaking. Sure. Tell me a little bit about that idea. Well, the premise basically is We First is a tonic to the Me First mentality that's been out there. And basically ruling business for the last several decades and was largely responsible for what got us in trouble in 2008 and now we see a lot of those same you know, behaviors coming back again in which case we need to accept the reality of the business world we live in which is we are now an intimately connected mutually dependent global community so how do we practice business in a different way so when we see what happens on Wall Street affects Main Street, affects Iceland, Greece, the EU, when we see people being able to communicate using Facebook and Twitter in real time all around the world, yeah. what does that mean for business and how can it be directed in a positive way to get us out of the economic mess that we're in? Well, so far, business hasn't done spectacularly well handling not just social media, but the Internet in general. And you know, in many cases, big businesses have traditional media channels that they like to use. They're very reliable. They're very controllable. Right. And the prospect of people talking back, well, that's a little bit scary if you're, if you're kind of hooked on that old style of marketing. Are there any examples of companies that are really doing a great job using social media? There's several. And they all do different things well. So, for example, Nike does a wonderful um, job of engaging their communities and then actually listening well. For example, when Nike did support for the uh, Livestrong campaign, Lance Armstrong campaign at the Tour de France last year, they not only spray painted messages in chalk from cancer sufferers on the road in front of the cyclists, they took photographs of those messages and sent them back to the people who sent them in, which shows that it was a dialogue and that the brand recognized how meaningful those messages were. Patagonia, Transparency, fantastic, their Footprint Chronicles initiative where they actually show where products are made and invite your feedback and suggestions as to how you might be able to improve you know, basically the wow, supply chain cool. of a product. So that's super cool. So that's like super transparency then, where absolutely. a manufacturer, a company that makes goods says, okay, here's how we make it, here's where we make it, come on a virtual tour, check out our factory, tell us what you think, are we treating our factory workers well, is this a sustainable Look how much trucking's involved, look at the carbon footprint of that product simply by entering the SKU number at their website. Now Nike and Patagonia, in a way, you're cheating because like these companies are always on the front edge of every kind of trend not sure. just you know social media but just about every marketing trend that's out there those companies are on the front edge right uh, are there traditional companies that are struggling to catch up are there examples of companies that are lagging behind absolutely I mean if you look at let's say the larger companies out there that often get criticized in the press for example Walmart has yeah. done a wonderful job of reducing its carbon footprint in the last year by reducing up to 30 percent as part of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which was started by Patagonia. 
If you look at another company like Unilever, which has done in, had achieved huge strides in terms of sustainability. If you look at companies like Procter & Gamble, they launched their blogovation campaign, which basically said, if you as a blogger promote this Click for Water campaign, we'll donate a dollar towards providing clean water you know, in the developing world sim you know, for everyone who engages in clicks and fans that, uh, that widget. So you see these big brands realizing that doing such efforts are not just sort of well intended, they're well received. They yeah. allow them to build community. They drive customer engagement, which ultimately impacts the bottom line. That's a pretty important shift to the idea of inviting people in a transparent way to participate, maybe rally around an, initi an initiative, mm -hmm. uh, blog about it, talk about it, you know, Twitter about it, and so forth. But doing it in a way that's right up front. You know, right. Walmart got busted a few years ago because they were paying bloggers kind of on the sly to sure. talk about their brands. That backlash immediately. And actually, it's, I think it's one of the classic examples of how to go wrong, how to, how to use social media in the wrong ways, to right. try to manipulate it in the way that they would with traditional media. The worst media. thing you can ever do is doctor your Facebook page or manage your Twitter account because that only inflames it. And, you know, there's been a lot of commentary later about is social media to blame, for example, with the riots in London? Social media is really just, org they are organizing tools. And right. yes, they were used to organize the riots. And yes, they were also used to organize the cleanup of the city through initiatives like Cup of Tea and so on, where the same young people were using these same tools to go and say, we do not want to participate in the riots and we want to clean up the city. So really, the root of the problems is not social media itself, but they allow people to organize themselves in very dynamic ways. I agree with that, and last week we talked a little bit about some of the craziness that occurs because this channel is so unpredictable, and right. it's so fast, it's so much faster even than television, that traditional media needs roller skates to keep, keep right. up with it, particularly when something's breaking out amongst a group of people. You know, uh, in the last couple of weeks, of course, the big story was London and the UK riots. Uh, also, last week we had the story of San Francisco's BART system, their regional transportation system. Right. They shut down the BlackBerry messenger uh, service. They actually shut down the cell service on the trains to prevent people from organizing spontaneously and creating a demonstration. So, you know, here you have examples, I guess, of governments throwing off their footing and maybe overcompensating, trying to deal with social media sure. on the one hand. But boy, the story for big brands has been one of nothing but struggle and crisis when it comes to new media. Uh, so many of them have gotten it wrong, and the consequences are swift and severe. The, the backlash happens almost instantaneously. You know, certainly Nike is an example of a company that's been pilloried for their practices, uh, how they treat their workers, particularly in South Asia. I think, you know, all of that is justifiable in that the fundamental premise is that consumers are now more informed thanks to the web, more capable of sharing information thanks to social media, and more distrusting than ever, if you look at reports by Edelman and other PR firms since 2008, in which case they're looking at brands and saying, if you want us to support you with our purchasing power, you better be more socially responsible in your behavior. And the great challenge for brands are several. Firstly, their profit centers and their business models are based on old media and old technology. Right. Secondly, the institutional nature, the hierarchical nature of those institutions does not lend itself well to real-time engagement because you know, you'll often hear a brand saying there's six tiers of approval before we can send out a tweet. And thirdly, it's very, very hard for any company of any size to integrate technology that's moving this quickly. And the big change has been that right now all of this new social media technology is going to the consumer first. And then they're using it to speak to brands. So the brands are constantly playing catch up. Yeah, that's right. And those consumers not only use it in the way it was intended, they actually use it in new ways that could never be imagined. And every time a brand or an institution tries to shut down social media, that just is a, a call to arms for creativity, find new ways to get around it. Very true. It's very true. So, so the, if you attempt to control it too much, whether you're a government or a biz, big business, if you attempt to control the conversation too, too much, mm -hmm. then you're almost inevitably inviting backlash or someone's going to do some funny thing. They're going to take your message and distort it in ways that are not just out of your control, but they run counter to your purpose. Right. Whereas these, the companies you're ex you've expressed examples of, uh, some of those companies actually kind of relinquish control to their audience. They say, hey, here's a thing that we're doing. And if you're into it, if you like this, if you identify with this, take the message and run with it. Absolutely. There's two principles I, I speak about. One is that a brand needs to shift from being the celebrity of its community to being its chief celebrant. And that is a relinquishment sort of of control. It yeah. used to say, we're going to celebrate what you want to achieve. Secondly, I believe that technology is teaching people to be human again. And that applies to a brand as well, in which case being human means making mistakes, saying you're sorry, 
responding inappropriately at times and then taking responsibility for it, being transparent, being accountable. So I don't think the very controlling nature of brands and institutions who are beholden to their sort of analysts and the street and um, shareholders are very comfortable with that messiness in a sense. Yeah. But you need to be more human in your engagement. So this is an enormous challenge and it's going to be, you know, the thing that will determine the companies to succeed in the future will be their quality of listening and how human they can be in their engagement with their customer base. Well, that's an interesting notion of a company becoming human. I think of it, when you say that, I think there is no Mr. Sony or Mr. Apple, or maybe, maybe Steve Jobs, sure. um, or, or you know, Mr. Walmart. There's no right. single individual behind there. In fact, those companies' brands aren't really built in a humanistic fashion. They're sure. built to be larger than life. They're these kind of global, you know, massive, country sprawling, uh, larger than, than human scale right. kind of brands. Uh, that's got to be a gigantic shift, right? Because in, in many cases, there'll be thousands of people inside the company and also vendors who are managing their brand or managing their messaging. So how do you distill it down to a single person or a single voice? The brand voice can exist in a consistent way. Hmm. But the challenges for brands of any size are enormous. Firstly, at a leadership level, you need buy-off because we all know what it's like to work in a company where you don't have leadership sure, buy-off. Sure, yeah, it's true. Most media companies, you know, the people who are running well, traditional TV companies, traditional music labels, they don't use this stuff. So no. they really aren't in a position to tell people how to use it. And they're omnipotent and they're unapproachable. At the same time, that same leadership usually makes a rush to the market to, to their consumers when they've got to accept the fact that the first place that they should engage and be more human is with their employee base. Most employees do not know what the company they work for stands for. And that robs them of the opportunity to be a place where people, top talent wants to work, you know, um, the bottom line benefits of uh, employee retainer, retainership, um, and really inspiring your employee base to be your first line of word of mouth advertising. Only then do you look at customer service and going to the consumer. But it really means a reconstitution of the organization of a company. You know, you see this in a lot of different ways that corporate officers are changing their labels. We've got chief listening officers. We've got mission control centers for social media management. Right, you know, right, right. These, are, these are all the sort of window dressing it, it that we do. It does sound like window dressing to you me. Know, it does sound like window dressing. It, but it, it's a nice gesture. It means they're thinking about it, right? Yeah, it does show that they're thinking about it. And it shows that um, how difficult it is to integrate at, full, at a full sprint these changes that are so necessary. Right. And actually, you're right. If there is a chief listening officer and his job is to monitor the social feedback from right. people, it's actually cool that companies are recognize how important that is that they've right. got a chief officer focused on it. You know, in name only, it says that we are listening, and it works yeah. internally as well. If, for example, an employee volunteers at a pet shelter on the weekend, which is in alignment with the core values of the brand, and management calls that out and celebrates that in an internal blog or something, it tells the employees that they're listening, that they value the full selves that people bring to the office, you know, the, the, their values and so on, and that it really gives them a share of voice in the future and the sort of definition of the company and that has bottom line benefits that are borne out by all the different research so if people in this challenging economic time are looking at ways to inspire their employees to be more productive to be more engaged to be better ambassadors for the brand then social media is one of the ways to do it now one of the things that you keep bringing up and it also comes up in your book is this notion of trust and so I want to talk a little bit about trust uh, because one of the points you've raised, you mentioned it just a minute ago, is uh, we're starting to not trust messages that come to us from major media. We're starting sure. to understand that there's a second story, the one that was edited out or left on the cutting room floor. We certainly, as consumers, are a little bit suspect about branded messages in particular, right? right? So we always suspect that we're kind of being, there's spin control going on there, even with our politicians. So, <laughs> so consumers have gotten smart, audiences have gotten smart, and now we have ways to talk amongst ourselves, and mm -hmm. so we can actually get smart and share information really fast, even if it's not necessarily accurate. Right. So there's that element of distrust of brands. But I think it actually stems from this desire for over-control coming from the brands themselves mm -hmm. because they don't trust their customers or their employees to stay on message. Right. So well, right. tell me a little bit about that. Well, it, it is a real concern and a, and a warranted one in that unless you have brand sort of protocols in place, unless mm -hmm. you define that brand voice, unless you've got systems in place, it will go awry. You will have problems. So you have some random person in your staff somewhere tweeting randomly about your company, Absolutely. but it might be totally off message. It might be a completely inappropriate conversation to have. Or at a, on a larger scale, basically all you do is broadcast your schizophrenia. You know, to one <laughs> audience you're this, to another you're this, you know, your competitor's doing this, so you copy them. So, you know, it is a challenge for brands, but also 
from a consumer point of view, that distrust is very real. In the context of 2008, in the context of all the revelations that we know right now, if you look at the 2011 Edelman Trust Barometer Report which came out, trust in, by consumers in business to do the right thing has slipped eight points in the last year, and we are now five points above Russia. Wow. In terms of consumer trust, at this, and the Edelman's Good Purpose report for 2010 came out and they revealed the fact that 86% of global com um, consumers want brands to put society's needs on the same level as a company's needs. So if you look at those two together, we're not trusting business and we expect them to be more accountable for you know, creating the well-being of society at large, and we're armed with these social media tools suddenly you've got this movement of change. You know, consumers are engaged with their brands. It's not just a dialogue about the latest widget or the latest pair of running shoes. It's like, what is the impact on the environment? How are you helping to make things better? Government has all this debt. We hear it all the time. Philanthropy has limited resources. What are you doing? We hear about your record profits. We hear about how much the CEOs are being paid. And we're in trouble and we can't pay for our health care, housing. We're in a, are we facing the prospect of a double dip recession? What are you doing? Now, how do companies respond to that? So you're, you have a consultancy, you work yeah. with major brands, and sure. they'll bring you in and they'll say, Simon, solve this problem for us. We're right. confronted by an audience that's newly <laughs> empowered to share their opinion. They're holding us accountable in ways we've never been held accountable Absolutely. before Absolutely. by government or by right. our shareholders. Now we're being held accountable by our customers. Who sure. are these people? Who, what right do they have to hold us accountable? It was sure transactional before. <laughs> now we have to talk to them? What, what do you mean? No, I, what I do with a company is make it very, very clear that a lot of efforts that have been done in the past, which on the face of it are well intended, like cause marketing or corporate social responsibility initiatives, are not enough. Mm -hmm. We need to end this false separation between living and giving, where we only consider the well-being of others or society after we've taken our profits or discharged our fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. Instead, we, and this is not window dressing, I'm not talking about just doing something good to make up for the bad that you're doing. Instead, we need to integrate purpose into the for-profit business model in a way that also benefits the brand. So if you're a brand, let's identify what you stand for. Let's identify your core values. And then let's do social outreach consistent with that, which will be meaningful to your customer base, which will earn loyalty, goodwill, and ultimately profit for the brand. But at the same time you're doing those good efforts, whether it's the environment, recycling, breast cancer, whatever it might be, as long as it's consistent with the for-profit narrative of the brand, you're actually reinforcing the brand narrative, the for-profit right. brand story. Yeah. But instead, You'll have brands doing bad things over here and doing good things over here. There's a disconnect in the consumer's mind. It smacks of window dressing. Yeah. We're already coming to it with a distrustful posture. And so brands are left there frozen. We can't talk about the good we're doing. We can't because they're going to point out the bad we're doing. And so we don't say anything. Oh, so one, one message you're clearly giving your, your uh, customers then is you've got to participate. You don't have a choice. You, no. can't be a, you cannot be silent when there's a conversation happening around your brand, around your product, and around your ecosystem, your marketplace. You've right. got to be in that dialogue, otherwise your voice is lost. Well, there's two costs. One cost is non-engagement is you don't temper or moderate the negative things that are being said. And I was sitting in a meeting with a client once and they said, you know, why should we be using this thing called Twitter? And I said, are you in front? It was a conference call and I said, would you open your computers? And we went into Twitter and they put in the client's name and the first tweet that was out there was just expletives about the brand, which is very telling. You've got to be able to moderate that. Secondly, there's an enormous upside if you use it in a positive way. You can really get your community to go to work for you on the basis of shared values connected by social technology. So you lose the upside of tempering the negative and you lose the upside of actually letting it drive your business. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about some, some pop cultural trends and we'll come sure. back to sort of seeing how that fits in with this grand mission that you've described here. And we're talking to Simon Mainwaring. He's the author of We First and you can reach him at, uh, you, can, you can follow him on Twitter at Simon Mainwaring, Simon Mainwaring. Of course, we want to hear from you here at This Week in Social Media, so please connect with us on Twitter. It's TWI Social Media. Send us your thoughts and feedback at socialmedia@thisweekend.com. Again, that email is socialmedia@thisweekend.com. And it's Simon Mainwaring. So while we're having this high-minded and noble conversation sure. about the really great uses of social media to hold big business accountable and maybe get them to behave in a way that's a little <laughs> bit more sustainable and a little bit better for the environment and economy, here we have some interesting new trends. So uh, I'm looking at Mashable this week at the Twitter trends. And what do we have on Twitter trends? Well, this week, top Twitter trends on Mashable. Soccer and football is a big week. You know, here in the U.S., holidays, August, kind of a slow week for all sorts of media, including social media. But soccer was big. Uh, 
followed by Jersey Shore. We'll come back to that in a second. Then Heron Potter and Justin Bieber, who's always there. Yeah. Quite obviously, what people want to talk about amongst themselves isn't necessarily big brands or products and merchandise or even scandals necessarily. <laughs> they want to talk about pop culture, the kinds of stuff that they're consuming on a regular sure. basis. So now, if I were a marketer, and let's say I wanted to reach that audience, connect with them, typically what I'd do is I'd buy a 30-second spot in that program, and then my message would be kind of alongside that show. Right. How does this change now in a world of social media? The audience is still interested in Justin Bieber. They're still talking about Jersey Shore. How do I work my, con myself into that conversation if I'm a big brand? A absolutely. And you know that, those sort of trends are being driven by both parties. Consumers, this is what they're interested in, or young people who are obviously more media savvy anyway and engage with social media. But also, you know, all of these brands are driving engagement with Harry Potter and all these sorts yeah. of things. So there's a more noise about those out there, which is why it's weighted so heavily in and terms of And they have gigantically dreams. loyal fan bases. I mean, they have all the passion stuff. that they're tapping into. But yeah. what you would really do is, you know, we've all heard this term crowdsourcing, where you can reach out to your community and involve them in the process. So, for example, if you're J.K. Rowling, you know, you could say, listen, I'm going to create a wizard's book that, you know, breaks out some of the spells that you've seen over the seven, you know, the seven books in the series. You know, are there any, what favorite spells do you have, for example? Or you may share behind the scenes footage of a movie or outtakes with your audience to build that sort of, you know, interest before a movie comes out. Sure. So really it's about saying, it's not prescriptive anymore. It's not broadcast. We're not pushing this on you. You're, we're in this together. I'll give you an example. Mountain Dew, they actually crowdsourced the launch of their three new flavors recently. They, you go to their website, you put in your address, they send you seven different cans of labeled A to F, and you ha all you have to do is videotape yourself doing the taste test and send it back in. The community decided the three final flavors. The community named those flavors. The community chose the advertising agency. The community approved the creative that was done by the advertising agency. The community approved the media plan. Wow. And that is a dramatic example of engagement. Where they, fantastic. And why do they do that? I mean, if you look at another example, Levi's, yeah. they recently crowdsourced on Facebook the new faces of their brand, the guy and the girl, the Levi's guy and girl. The reason they do that is the community is already invested in the result before yeah. it's even gone to market. Totally right. It's like voting for your favorite politician. Then once the person's elected to office, you sort of feel a fan base, a fan exactly. loyalty towards that person. You are involved in the decision making That's and therefore it. you're engaged. And actually, that kind of subconsciously or not encourages you to share it more because you have That's vested it. interest in its success. Yeah, I think that's a big one. I think people do invest themselves in brands that they're passionate about. Right. I think this is one of the one of the core fundamental principles of branding. You know, we use that term branding all the time, right? Mm -hmm. That we toss that word around. To me, it's quite simple. A brand is a promise, mm -hmm. right? So when you walk down the aisle in the grocery store, you have a choice. You could buy a can of beans with a white label, a generic product, or you could buy, you know, Land Lakes or the Jolly Green Giant. You see that brand, you recognize right. it in the back of your mind subconsciously after you've been conditioned by a million messages seen over your lifetime. Sure. You pick up that, that jar with the Jolly Green Giant on it because it, you feel like a sense of trust. You feel a sense of, there's a promise this is going to be a quality product right. before you've made the purchase. Now, one of the strange things is brands turn into something different when they come into social media because it's not all about one way pushing out of messages. Right. So instead of it being uh, you know, a promise that's inherent in something, uh, then that message has gotten drilled into your head, now a brand has to be something experiential, something right. that we do together. And I think that's kind of the core premise of your book, if I'm not mistaken. It's kind of right at the heart of it. You're saying yeah, social yeah. media is what's going to make companies behave in a more ethically responsible fashion. It is in the sense that you know, consumers never had a platform before. They didn't know how to talk back, and now they do. And yes, only a small proportion of engagement on social media will be dedicated to these conversations. Much of it will be spent talking about Harry Potter or ja <laughs> right, sure. Justin Bieber. Yeah. Um, but you know, it is difficult for brands. It's like watching your grandfather try and dance to a new hit song and you're a teenager. They just don't seem to kind of, you know, yeah, it's a get hard, a hard one to get. It, yeah. it, it's a hard one to do and a hard one to watch. <laughs> and uh, so really, what a brand needs to do is there's an expression right now, more brands are becoming human and more humans are becoming brands. And the marketplace is deconstructing in a sense uh, because this you know, hierarchy and these sort of verticals are proving it, making it very difficult for companies to respond in real time. In which case, brands need to accept that they do need to be more human. It's no accident that brands like Virgin with Richard Branson or you know, um, Phil Knight at Nike, and so, these large companies are successful in a sense because they're an extension of these clearly defined individuals whose own voice has, holds great sway in those companies. 
And I think you can take that as a model for where we need to go in the future. We need to really identify what a brand stands for, articulate and define what its voice is, and communicate that consistently, talking about issues that are meaningful to your customers, and then celebrating their successes so they want to use these tools to promote your brand for you. It's a tough one, right? If you think about the companies, even the companies you just mentioned, people mm -hmm. like Phil Knight at Nike, uh, you know, we're not used to hearing from him, and I'm sure he's not in the habit of communicating no, every thought on Twitter. Not. Sure. Uh, I run into that a lot with the companies that I deal with, where they say, yeah, you know, it's just not for us. Uh, right. Our CEO is never going to open a Twitter account. He's never going right. to talk about it. Or some companies will say, gee, we have a proprietary process, and that yeah. information is secret. Those are trade secrets. We're not going to broadcast that information out yeah. to the world. Yeah. So you've given us a couple really awesome examples where you know, the, the community was invited to participate sure. in a decision-making process that was totally transparent for mm -hmm. even those who didn't participate got a chance to see what happens behind those doors. But I think for every company like that, there's probably a hundred companies that still yeah. haven't quite got their heads wrapped around opening up their process and making what was previously opaque totally transparent. Yeah, it's difficult because obviously everyone's got competitive advantages they don't want to share. But at the same time, it's, it's almost forcing brands to really put their shoulder behind their PR, in a sense. They have to become mm -hmm. their own PR agents. And the choice is extreme. You can either be like a Tony Shea, who runs Zappos, yeah, good example. Who, who has built their business on being engaged themselves, yeah. or a Howard Schultz with Starbucks. On one hand, Howard Schultz is very vocal as a function of his book Onward, yeah. but also he's engaged in real time. And at the same time, Starbucks has MyStarbucks.com, mm -hmm. which invites customers to share service suggestions, drink suggestions, and so on. So, you know, you can be involved directly as a CEO, or you can just define that brand and not be involved directly. For example, Indra Nooyi of Pepsi, or PepsiCo, she actually doesn't speak directly on behalf of the brand, but her mindset has very clearly informed the shifts that have been going on in PepsiCo and Pepsi with a Pepsi Refresh project, amongst others. So, you know, it's not an either-or proposition. There's, mm -hmm. there's a spectrum in between. So what's the best way to get started? If you're working with a company that's never done social media and has been reluctant to even dip a toe in that right. ocean, what do you tell them to do first? It's, a, it's an unexpected answer in that people make the mistake of thinking social media is an end in itself. That's it's true. not. Yeah. It is just another channel through which to communicate in the timeless currency, which is emotion. Mm -hmm. We need an emotional connection between your brand and the customer. In which case, where should you start? Define your purpose. Mm -hmm. What does your company stand for? There are two types of companies out there. There are those brand new companies that are in their, their head smell of baby powder like a newborn baby. And then those sort of drug-addled rehab sort of, you know, brands that have gone off message that need to get fixed. And if you really want to do yourself the, you know, the greatest favor in terms of your bottom line, define what you stand for and message that consistently so that your consumers, will, that will resonate with your consumers, they'll know who you are, and then they can become brand ambassadors. So s define your, the, your company purpose, communicate that to your employees, and then develop strategies and go out to your consumers. Those would be the three steps. Mm. I think probably also it would launching such a service, uh, such a campaign, would cause a company to have a really serious discussion about what they actually stand for. Right. What do we really mean as a company? Not as a brand, not as a, a slogan, <laughs> not as an ad or a billboard or something, but actually what is this company really about? If you think of the companies that are tremendously successful, we, we've mm -hmm. named a bunch, and the names always come up because right. it's quite clear to everybody they do stand for. Starbucks is a company that we always talk about when right. it's about innovative marketing and, and digital media and so forth. Yeah. Nike is a company that comes up, we talk about branding yeah. always, right? For 30 years yeah. they've come up. Apple is another one that comes to mind. There's a lot of news that's been happening in the last couple of weeks as company after company that makes gadgets and gizmos and computers has been bailing out of the business or trying to fi figure out a way to like hive off an unproductive or unprofitable uh, technology arm right. because Apple has so radically redefined the terms of success for a hardware company. I think we know what, hardware, what a hardware company like Apple stands for. What we don't know is what a hardware company like Dell or HP stand for. They're very fuzzy ideas. Uh, certainly, in my mind, as a consumer, I don't know what they stand for. I think that what you just said is very, very telling with what ha just happened with the ThinkPad last week, which, exactly. has been, which has been pulled. As a function of a lack of brand definition, a lot of competitors are looking at a brand like Apple and saying, well, listen, we'll let them not only take the risk of defining a new category as they did with the iPhone and the iPad, but also working through the user interface to a large extent, and then we'll create a me-too product and see what we can get out of that. That's right. But the pace of the market is such now 
the, and the adoption is of you know the the obsolescence and the adoption rate of these new products is such that you know when you come out with a new compelling product, you'll suck up most of that market as quickly as possible. In which case, you know, a competitor doesn't have a place. There isn't enough room to make it sustainable. And I think the real disappointment with what HP did was they copied Apple in a sense. In a lame way with a sluggish device that wasn't quite as good. There are a lot of people are huge fans of WebOS and, yeah. and the way it worked and so on, but it's clearly it doesn't perform at the same level as an iPad. Absolutely. And I think <laughs> a brand would be so much better served by taking a risk and developing its own IP, its own ingenuity as a function of its own distinct defined brand instead of mm -hmm. taking security or comfort in doing Me Too products building on the success of another brand like Apple. And I think the two are very related. How well you understand your own brand, how clearly those core values are articulated, and your ability to go to market with new products that will resonate because of what you did, hmm. not what another brand did. OK, let's talk about some social media brands that are out there, because things like Twitter, those are also a brand. Sure. They have a promise to us, right? And Twitter, I think, actually has quite a vivid promise. And right. They've played a, a pivotal role now in every type of societal change that's happened in the last well, the last 12 months, yeah. even longer, really. You right. can date it back to uh, to the, 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 the outbursts and demonstrations in Tehran in 2009. So people have discovered Twitter as a channel that enables people to communicate directly and organize right. our, uh, events, organize demonstrations, sometimes organize things that aren't so good. But it's, Twitter's now started to take, started to take a, a role in our lives mm -hmm as a brand that's all around action, around right. doing things, organizing things, and communicating directly with people. OK, now let's talk about Facebook mm -hmm. and Facebook as a brand. I'd love to hear your thoughts about Facebook as a brand in our lives. And what do they represent? Well, Facebook, Facebook you know, was the architect of this new space, in a sense, mm -hmm. in that they came out, they tapped into our warm markets, our friends, our family. They allowed this landscape of sort of our social graph for each of us to be built. And as a function of that, they have taken all the slings and arrows that come when you sort of push privacy tolerances, you sure. have to pull back, and well so deserved, on. Well-deserved, in my opinion. Yeah, and well-deserved. And now there's a major competitor with the Google Plus platform, which had a slightly more nuanced way for users to kind of define how they want to share material through their circles. And now we're seeing Facebook respond to that by allowing people greater control over who sees what yes. information they share whether they actually approve or not, they're tagging of them in a photograph. And the, their understanding of what are now simpler privacy settings. So I actually think this competition is good because it's forcing both parties, parties to be more nuanced in the way they allow people to relate to each other, more open and more sort of um, available in terms of the privacy settings. And uh, I think the monopoly that they had for a long time is kind of gone because, you know, Google Plus is building on Gmail, which is a huge reservoir right. of, you know, of a, a database while Facebook is building on these 5,000 friends and family that we have. Well, it's a good point, and I think, you, I think you're right about the competition causing Facebook to maybe clean up their act a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, Facebook has damaged their own brand because they've screwed us as consumers relentlessly. So many times they've, fost they, they've foisted features on us that we weren't looking for, they've siphoned our data uh, without us knowing it, without us expressly giving permission. And so that created a market space for an alternative, for someone else to come along. And there were many attempts, right? Because right. Diaspora is a sort of open source attempt to try to replicate uh, Facebook but give you more control over right. your data and your friends and so forth. Uh, there's a sense that all of, our, all of our information, all of our personal contacts are being sucked into Facebook and it's becoming their intellectual property. That scares right. people, at least those who are aware of it. So that created a market space for Google to walk in and actually look like a hero, right? right. Now, I don't necessarily think Google is such a great hero, but they just walked right into that spot now, and they look right. like the white knight. And they've kind of positioned Facebook on the defensive, for the very first time, on the defensive because of their past sins. And there's right. no question about it. Facebook has absolutely ripped people off in terms of their, in terms of their private data. Uh, whether or not we were willing to give that information, they took it without asking for it. And right. I think there's a breach of a social contract. If there was an a, a essential piece of um, of a brand promise in social mm -hmm. media, it's we're not going to steal your data. That's got to be a <laughs> fundamental part of any social media as a brand. And I think Facebook stumbled there. Now they're trying to recover from it. And these new, these new privacy tools that were announced this week, I haven't gotten them on my account yet. No, I haven't, have. I haven't got them on mine yet. But I, That's a step in the right direction. Right? I, I would offer a couple of considerations, one of which is that the world of privacy as we know it is gone in the sense that if we all were aware of all the information that everybody has on us already, 
it's very hard to argue that we have any uh, opportunity to protect our privacy anymore anyway. And I'm not saying that that's right, I'm just saying that that's the reality. Secondly, I would say that we are now in the data trading business, irrespective of what product or service we provide. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, if you look at someone like Lady Gaga, who's launching her own social network called Little Monsters, it's because she would like to own and have access to the data of her fan base. And you know, all of these brands are now in the data trading business because that makes them obviously more effective marketers. And it, it puts them in the position where we're volunteering all the stuff that they used to have to reach out and get. The privacy debate, I would suggest that Facebook, probably one of the, the misunderstandings that played into the whole privacy debate was, I think Mark Zuckerberg and others had a very, very sort of um, evolved view of where the marketplace was going in terms of the need for everyone to have a social graph and what, that would add, what value that would add to their life and also what business opportunity that represented to him. And I think he was guilty sometimes of getting too far out ahead sure. of people and That's pulling true. it back. Yeah. So, you know, rather than point the finger at, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, the founders of Google or anybody else, I think the marketplace itself, as a function of the information age, the digital revolution, and now the social media revolution, is going that way. And one of the casualties is our privacy, and that's very, very hard to kind of turn back once, once the technology exists that will drive that, that loss of privacy. So one of the reactions to that, I, I think it's clear and I agree with you, one, one of the reactions to that trend of ever greater transparency, whether we want it or not, mm -hmm. is that we, we as individuals, we as consumers, we as an audience, are going to demand an equal amount of transparency from the institutions, exactly. whether it's government, where there's a rampant amount of, of privacy going on there. Or let's say, you know, security gone amok in Washington. Sure. You know, everything's classified now. So, you know, the amount of classified information in D.C. has increased by like something like tenfold over the past ten years since right. since 9/11. Uh, so there's an addiction to secrecy there in our government institutions and also among corporations. They're not in the habit of sharing information freely, right. but they are clearly now in the habit of siphoning and pilfering as much data as they possibly can from consumers. But this newly empowered consumer, fueled mostly by social media tools, right. is now able to hold those companies accountable. So I look at it as almost like an arms race. And as they're strip mining our privacy and mining it for whatever business purpose, we're going to start to use social media tools and organize ourselves spontaneously to hold those companies accountable and maybe reveal secrets that they don't want revealed. Well, I mean, look at this context of the world we now live in. When I started writing the book in 2008, there was the president hadn't been elected by connected con citizens. There was no WikiLeaks. Right. There had no, been no oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. There was no spring revolutions in the Arab world but here we are in a world now of consumer distrust consumer awareness on a scale never seen before th thanks to the internet and real-time you know updates from Syria Libya wherever it might be and also they've got the tools to push back against brands in a way they've never been able to before and I think brands like Patagonia for example which are very transparent or nonprofits like Charity Water which allow, allow you GPS technology to see where your dollars are going to see where the, the oil the um, water wells are being drilled uh, that's very powerful and compelling so I actually think the determinant moving forward more will be how transparent, how transparent and accountable brands will allow themselves to be because that was, that's what consumers want then these consumers are getting more and more sophisticated in their use of these tools, more and more organized, and more and more fed up with the sort of disempowerment that's going on for the very reasons you're talking about. So they're going to seize back control of the conversation. They're going to demand it in some way. It's, it's really a choice. It's up to you as a consumer. The only leverage they have is their buying power. The only leverage they have. If you're not going to impact a company's bottom line, they're not going to care what you think in which case they're going to vote with their dollars in the shopping aisle, they're going to use mobile applications through their smartphones like Good Guide, which allow you to use a barcode scanner, point at the barcode of that product, get the social impact rating of that product, and choose that carton of orange juice over another. Why? Because you care about certain issues in your life. I've even heard now that some companies in their customer care centers, mm -hmm. when you phone in to talk about their product or their service, or maybe to complain about something that's gone wrong, They'll look you up, they'll try to check out your cloud score, they'll try to see if you've got a lot of followers on Twitter or any right. other social network, uh, and, and decide whether or not you've got enough influence to matter. And apparently, I have not had this experience, but I have heard from people who claim 
that they've actually been able to get you know uh, rebates or discounts Absolutely. or some sort of reimbursement for I've something heard, that's going on. I've heard the same thing, and there are also services out there that look to your so your social graph or your social profiles to identify what music you like in the time that you're waiting for that phone call to be answered, so that by the time hold music comes on, it's music you like. Oh, this is great. So we're telegraphing this whole pattern of our interests and our tastes and who we're connected to and who we follow. So where does the responsibility lie, mm -hmm. in a sense? Companies are now using that not just to manipulate us, but also in some sense to serve us even better, I suppose. To, to serve us even better, but at the same time, we're sitting there as consumers going, let me tell you everything about me that you didn't know, but God forbid, don't use it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so there is a shared responsibility here in a sense. And uh, so we need to be very, very careful. That's why, you know, I talked about in the book we first was how brands and consumers use social media to build a better world because they're both responsible. We were responsible as consumers for over-consuming mm. in the run-up to 2008, keeping up with the Joneses, fulfilling the American dream. Yes, Wall Street and the big banks and the big corporations were culpable without a doubt. But look at the way that we're all treating the environment that we all share. So, you know, we all need to take responsibility and say, we're going to play a part as mindful shoppers in the shopping aisle, even if I'm a busy mum. We're going to take the, you know, we're going to take responsibility as a CEO or as an employee and bring our core values to life. We're going to take responsibility when we do something wrong as a company and say, you know what, our bad, we did make a mistake, we screwed up, and we're sorry for it, rather than trying to manage it, much like we saw with BP after the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, where they tried misinformation and doctoring photographs and all those different strategies in an old world sense, which only inflamed the new media world even more. Well, we've been talking to Simon Mainwaring, the author of We First author and the CEO of the company by the same name. We First is a New York Times bestseller. It's a terrific read and it's all about how social media can actually create a positive impact and cause companies to be a little bit more accountable, a little bit more responsible. We want to hear from you here, so please send your thoughts to us at socialmedia at thisweekend.com. I'm Rob Terzik and I'm signing off. I'll see you next week.